If you have your Bibles with you, if you turn to me, turn with me to the book of Luke in chapter 12 is where we will be this morning. I love that song, Choosing the Refiner's Fire. We choose to allow God to work in our lives. Sometimes it's not comfortable, but he molds us and he makes us. And if we'll just follow, he'll make us into something that is beautiful in his eyes. Luke chapter 12 is where we will be this morning. We're continuing along in the theme that we have been focused on this year as we are um, thinking about the fact that it's time to contend. Uh, it's time to step up in our lives and to perhaps take a step forward in different ways throughout the year. Um, there's a lot of complacency going on in our country um, and in the, the lives of Christians even. We are very easily persuaded to just stay where we are. And so we've been studying the fact that we need to fight forward. And so the first week we looked at it's a battle of our mind and we have to be willing to fight just the daily fight of not worrying about what other people are going through. I just need to focus on me. And then we continued studying on um, last week, thinking about sometimes we fell because we just like our sin. And we don't focus on it as sin. We just, there's something in our lives, and the Bible may speak to it very specifically, but just, I like it, and I'm not going to change. Sometimes we're just stubborn in that way. Today we're going to switch gears, but we're going to talk about another issue that we need to conquer in our lives if we're struggling with it. And that's one of money. Money becomes a um, habitual problem for a lot of people. And so, not preaching on tithe this morning, I'll reserve that for tonight. Um, well, we're just talking about money in general and how does money affect us in our lives? And so we're going to study that this morning. If you would stand with me as we read out of the book of Luke in chapter 12, if I sound like I have COVID, I don't, um, allergies down here. I don't know what's going on, but I feel like you guys got some wicked allergies. These aren't supposed to come until like April, like in normal places where you have four seasons. So I don't know what's going on here, but it is. It's a battle I've been fighting this week, and I'm going to win. So I'm going to contend with these allergies for the duration of however long. But anyway, bear with me. I, I'm not contagious unless allergies can spread, and in which case, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> have a new round of quarantine, I suppose. All right, Luke chapter 12. Let's start in verse 13, and we'll read down to verse 34. It says this, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, 
a treasure in the heavens that felleth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we just um, come before your throne, privileged to be allowed there, Lord God. We thank you for being a God who is high and lifted up and yet so willing to come to us and to speak to us, Lord God. We thank you for allowing us to draw nigh to you. We thank you for allowing us to hear from you. And this morning we ask, Lord, that you would just speak to each one of us. I ask that you would use me as a tool in your hand to speak very plainly and clearly the truth that you have for us this morning. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. In the portion of scripture we just read, it's abundantly clear that God has a set of directives for money. In particular, in very broad terms, what he has said here is that what you think of money and how you handle money is indicative of who you are or can be as a Christian. Perhaps said differently, there is a direct correlation between how you think of money and how you're going to live in your relationship with God. And this becomes apparent as we think through some very basic illustrations in the Bible. We think about Zacchaeus. Remember the wee little man for all of you in junior church and Sunday school who used to sing about Zacchaeus and the wee little man and the wee little man was he. Does everybody remember that song? If not, we're going to sing it right now. Brother Nick's going to come up here and lead it because that would be awful if I did. But anyway, so right, we got Zacchaeus and he was a publican, right? He was a tax collector. And at this time, um, he was allowed by the authority of Rome, not just to collect taxes for Rome, but he could basically get whatever he could on top of that and whatever he could pat on top, he was allowed to take. And that was the legal system at the time. The Romans were okay with it as long as they received their money. They frankly didn't care. And so Jesus goes to Zacchaeus and he says, you come down, right? Anyway, that's not what it says, but that's what we sing in the song for I'm going to your house today, right? And so he says, I'm going to your house today, Zacchaeus. And he goes to Zacchaeus' house and Zacchaeus sees Jesus for who he is, and he says, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and, that, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. So we see Zacchaeus, who was a man who was able to get by taking, and who did get by taking, and he sees Jesus, and he says, Okay, I'm going to start giving to the poor, and I'm going to repay all the people fourfold what I took from them. And you just see this kind of basic example that when somebody sees Jesus for who he is, their perspective on money changes. When we see God in a right light, our perspective of wealth goes from a very selfish perspective to an altogether different thing. We think about the rich young ruler that went to Jesus on a different occasion. And he went to Jesus and he said, you know, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, what seest thou? And he says, basically, you have to follow the Ten Commandments and and Jesus says, that, thou hast said well. And he says, oh, I've done that from my youth on up. What else do I have to do? And Jesus says, sell your goods and give it to the poor and follow me. And the man goes away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Again, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not quoting this by any means. But you're, you're with me. You know the story here. You know what's going on. And so we see a man now who could never have a relationship with God that he was supposed to have because his focus was on money. And so we just start in these few very um, coarse examples to see the fact that money and how we think about it and how we handle it is indicative of the relationship that we do or we do not have with God. We think about money. Money in and itself is neither good nor bad. It's just a neutral possession, if you want to say it that way. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have great wealth. We think about Abraham. He was loaded in terms of cattle, right? I mean, he had to be kicked out of a country because his cattle were so much that they filled out the country, filled up the country. Like, is that not a lot? I mean, we see some of the cattle ranches around here with their longhorns, which are just incredible animals to see. But can you imagine having so many sheep and goats and all these other things that they're like, you got to move out of Texas. We're too full. I mean, that's a lot of money. He had great wealth and he passed it on to Isaac and to Jacob. Um, we think about Job who had great wealth, and we know God allowed him to have it taken away, but then he gave him more. We can think about David, who was very wealthy. We think about Solomon, who may have been the most wealthy of all the kings. God doesn't have a problem with wealth. In fact, often he blesses men and ladies who follow him with wealth. Sometimes it's material wealth, sometimes it's spiritual wealth, sometimes it's mental wealth, sometimes it's a combination of things. It's in his good pleasure to give it as he will, but God wants to bless us, and frequently he uses wealth as a means of doing so. So money is not bad. 
But money can be used for bad. We, we think about people like Achan, right? He wanted money for himself, so what did he do? He stole some, a wedge of gold. What is a wedge of gold anyway, right? Like, I don't know. It's like an axe head, right? I, I don't know what it looks like. I always see a wedge, and it's like an actual wedge. Why did they cut a wedge of gold? I don't know. Um, it's just a fascinating thing to think about. If you've never thought about it, contemplate that for a minute. And a Bab Babylonian garment. What does that mean? It's like kind of like Babylon garments, like Babylonian-ish. Like, I, I don't know. Do you guys not pick up on these things when you're reading these stories? Like, I'm like, what does this mean? Like, it was a knockoff, right? They were like Nikes, but not. I, I don't know what it was going on there. So anyway, but he sees it and he wants it and he takes it and it's, it's for my good, but it does great evil to Israel. Or we think of um, other men in the Bible who did great evil, Balaam. Balaam was supposedly a prophet of God, and yet Balak wants him to curse Israel, and he does everything he can to try to curse Israel because he wants money. Or perhaps the ultimate example of wanting money, Judas, willing to portray the Son of God because he wanted money. And so we see money is neither good nor bad, but people can use it for either good or bad. And so God, he doesn't see wealth as bad. He doesn't see wealth as good. Simply the way we use it is either good or or bad. We think about God. God's desire, again, is to bless those who faithfully serve him. We, he wants to provide our needs. Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. He wants to provide all your needs. He says, my God shall, my God will supply all of your needs. If you are a believer in him, he will supply your needs. James 1, 17 pushes it further. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with, him, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Good gifts, they're from above. God wants to give us good gifts. He wants to give us good things. I'm not preaching health and wealth, prosperity right now. We're not talking about that type of gospel, but God loves us. God wants to bless us. Matthew 19, these are some of my favorite verses in the Bible, um, mainly because we moved to Texas, so read them with me with that in mind. And chapter 19, verses 28 through 30 says this, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, again right now he's talking to the apostles, but we'll get to the next verse in a minute, that we, ye which who have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But then he says to everyone, and everyone that hath forsaken houses, this is why I like it, right? We left our house down there, we're living, but I know God has a good house for me, so that's why I'm loving this verse right now. But if you've forsaken houses, he's, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Again, God wants to bless us. We're serving him. He says, I got more for you. You may give up something. You may give up this, that, or the other, but he says, I'll bless you a hundredfold. He wants to bless us. It's his desire to bless us. And money is one object that God can use if it's in his divine will to bless us. Money's neutral. It's not, we know it can be the root of evil, right? For the love of money is the root of all evil. It can cause problems, but money in and of itself has no ability to do good or right. It's an object that we use to trade. It's something that we use as a means of exchange for goods and or services. It's neutral. And while it's neither good nor bad, it's often a priority in our lives. And that's what we're looking at this morning. The priority of money in our lives and what it causes. Again, you think of... Um, 1 Timothy 6.10, where it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. What I found really interesting in this is the phrase there, love of money, has a specific Greek word for that phrase. And it means fondness of silver or covetousness. Like, they have a word for fondness of silver, um, which tells me the Greek people really, really like their money. Uh, and you think about it, though, and we interpret it as covetousness or love of money. They, they had this obsession with silver. And that's kind of the picture that we are being taught about by Jesus this morning. Do we have an obsession with something else? Do we covet something else? Do we have this almost innate desire to go after something in such a way that it becomes sin in our lives? And so with all of that in mind, we get to our text. I know we kind of went off topic for a minute, but now we're going to rein it back in. And we're going to work expositorily through our text this morning. So the first thing we see is in verse 13. We just start off, and Jesus, in the first 
12 verses of Luke chapter 12 is preaching to his disciples who are all gathered around him. There's also this innumerable multitude that has gathered and he's going to start teaching them. And this man comes up in verse 13 and seemingly interrupts Jesus. And it says, and one of the company said unto him, master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So we have this man, he's listening to Jesus, he's hearing him speak, and he says, hey Jesus, hey Jesus, tell my brother that he's got to split the inheritance with me. The man's brother, again, we know nothing of this man other than in these, this one verse, really. The man's brother is probably the oldest brother, because he would be the one in charge of inheritances at this time historically. So he's probably the oldest brother, and we know from his words here that the older brother has probably decided the inheritance is mine, right? Like any good big brother or good big sister would do. They're like, eh, it's all for me. Sorry, you don't get a choice in the matter, right? Does anybody have a brother or sister like that? You don't have to raise your hand and show me. Um, that's okay, we won't. If you are the big brother or sister, let's raise our hand. All right, so we got a few of you. All right, so you guys know how you treat your little siblings. And seemingly something like that was going on because he is willing to go to Jesus and say, make him share with me. The man acknowledges Jesus as master. The word here would be um, the Greek interpretation for um, teacher or rabbi, if we were to go back to the Hebrew. So he's, he understood that Jesus is this teacher. He understands Jesus is one who is in the right place of authority to be able to arbitrate disputes under the law. And so the man, he stands there with Jesus, with the Son of God, hearing him in the first 12 verses, maybe seeing some miracles along the way if he had continued following him. And yeah, all he's concerned about is a little bit of money. The man only understood Jesus to be a man with knowledge. He's heard him preaching and teaching, and he's probably seen thing after thing that he has done, and yet now he just doesn't really see Jesus as anyone special. He's just like, oh, he's a judge. He can make my brother give me my money. Jesus, will you do that for me? And this is one of the tragedies, one of the perhaps the chief tragedies of our focus on things or on money. It's that those things take our full attention. They cause us not to see the forest for the tree, right? My wife said since I became pastor, I use um, metaphors and euphemisms more often than I used to. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's always been one of my favorite quotes. You don't see the forest for the tree, right? You're, you're so close to that one tree that you can't see around it and see everything else. That's this man. He, he's so focused on money that Jesus and the kingdom of God is in front of him, and he can't even figure out that it's there. And you think about our world, and most people will never turn to Jesus, not because they hate him, not because they don't believe in God, not because of anything other than the fact that they're so focused on something in this life that they will never see him. Frequently that thing's money. Many good people are going to suffer an eternal judgment. They're going to suffer in hell for all of eternity because they're quite simply too focused on money or working to get money or working for things. And yet Jesus stands there knocking, say, if any man open the door, I will come in. He's begging with people. He's pleading people. And yet we're very frequently just so focused. I don't, I don't even want to answer the door. I don't hear anybody talking to me. And it becomes a tragedy. But Jesus makes clear that the problem is not just an eternal one. It is one of the effects of this life as well as he starts talking to him. At the beginning again of chapter 12, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He's talking about, look, there's all these people in the world who are claiming to be religious and yet they live a completely different way. And then he goes on and he starts talking to the believers and he tells them that, you know, persecutions are coming and these other things are happening and people are going to criticize and mock you and they're going to... Um, engage in religion but they're really missing God and this guy goes up to him in the midst of all of this and says make him give me my inheritance and Jesus is addressing this not straight on right he's saying people are focused on religion and this guy's there listening to Jesus talk about religion make him give me some money I want my money he's blind to the fact of what's going on he was religious he was listening to Jesus, but he never heard what was being said. And it's a common problem in our lives. We are very frequently infatuated with things or with wealth or with the things that wealth can get us. And because we are, we miss it. And so Jesus says in verse 15, 
Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Beware of covetousness. We don't talk like that, right? Does anybody go up to people and say, hey, are you covetous today, right? We say, maybe coveting, do you want, right? I mean, we are plain and simple people. What's the thing that you want the most? What are you focused on? What are you thinking about all the time? What has your attention? Coveting causes our focus to be in the wrong place a lot of times. It causes all sorts of problems. Coveting is focusing on other things. Very frequently money. Very frequently things bought with money, right? How many of you, I probably shouldn't raise hands right now, but we'll just ask questions. You can think about these in your mind. How many of you have a wish list on Amazon loaded with things you're ready to buy? Right? We're coveting. And the rest of you who are men, how many of you have a wish list on Bass Pro Shop or Cabela's of things you're ready to buy? I don't know. I, I got one of those. So um, wherever it is, right? The golf store, the whatever place you have, the, I don't know. Some of you guys are probably traders. I'm like, I want to buy this type of stock. I, I, like I'm a failure at the stock market. I know nothing about it. And I, that's why they have companies to do this for you, right? I just give them some money and pray, Lord, take care of me one day, right? I, that's not the right approach. I realize I, I do. I, I'm giving some jest, but anyway, I, I, I do try to focus on it. But, but you understand my point. We all have like a not we all, we may have a list of things that we want a whole lot. We spend a lot of time focused on them. We spend a lot of time thinking about them and they distract us. We focus on building wealth or building assets or building collections of whatever. I would say something random, but then I'd have somebody come up to me after service and be like, I collect that. I'm like, focus on collecting cats and Nick's going to come up and talk to me about collecting cats. Or, well, I, I love picking on Nick. It's so fun. I don't know why. Because um, he's a good sport about it. Some of you, if I said I, something, I, I might get stoned after church, and I don't want to do that because um, I'll run away. Uh, but today, we, we largely refer to these things as wealth, right? I, I want this. I want that. It, it's my, my own version of wealth. I like to collect fishing poles, you know, and I got more than I should. And my dad, if I have more than I should, my dad has enough for like four for everybody in this church. He has enough fishing poles to like go around Texas and everybody would be fine. Um, if there's a fishing pole shortage, if we're all starving, go to my dad's house. We will fish and catch food and we'll be okay. Um, not that he's coveting it. I'm just saying it, it's an example. We, we can build things in our lives. And so we, we think about how we build things in our lives. I have a collection of this. You have a collection of that. I want this. I want, but does it become your focus like this man's money? Because Jesus says to him, he says this. Your life doesn't consist of the abundance of the things which you have. Indicating that life's meant to be more about, more than just about money. Your, your life's not to be just about your collection of whatever. It's not supposed to be just about the thing that you want the most. Jesus says, that's not life. Life is not that. And then he says, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. But I want to cut that short and just focus on this thought for a moment. For a man's life consisteth. What does your life consist of? We can think about all the different ways, all the different things that we can focus on, all the different things that jump out to us and grab our attention, all the different things that we want, all the things we want to do, and we'll just generically refer to it as wealth or money this morning. But don't think about it, oh, this message doesn't apply to me because I have no desire for money. Well, if you have a desire for Every color of yarn in the world, that might be a different problem, right? It's akin to the same thing. You got this obsession with something. I, teacups, maybe, or I don't know what it is. It's, it's, we all have our thing. Like you go into those ladies' houses, and they have their thimble collection that's from every state in the world. If that's your thing, great. But are you obsessed with it? Are you stuck on it? Is it the thing upon which you focus? And Jesus is saying, if there's something in your life that has got so much of your attention... Are you sure it's not the thing that you've tried to make your life consist of? Is it the thing that sets you apart? Is it what identifies you? This man, all he wants is money. Jesus says, why? This, this life isn't just money. When you die, if it's just money, what do you have to look forward to? Or what do you have to look back upon? And he says, that, he asks that question and he goes immediately into a parable. And he tells us the parable of a rich man who brought forth plentifully. 
So we know he's rich, and he has a bumper crop this year. I mean, so much so that the man says, I am going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. You like put some thought into that. Why would this man just instantly go into tearing down his barns and building new ones, right? Like if I had a big crop, I would want to sell it. Well, I mean, perhaps he had so much of a crop that if he put it into the market, he would flood the market and he would devalue his crop. He's a rich man already. He's savvy. He's not um, ignorant when it comes to market prices and things such as that. So he thinks, look, I'm rich. I'm about where I want to be. I've worked real hard my whole life. I'm almost arrived, right? I've been building my wealth and I've had good crop after good crop and I am wealthy and, I have rich and, I, and I'm rich and I have good barns and now I got a whole lot more. I'm about to make it. He's like, I, I've almost got as much as I want. So what am I going to do? I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger ones so that when I'm done, it's going to be easy street. It's time to retire. I'm going to have all the wealth I need. He has worked and worked and worked and worked very hard along the way, put in hour after hour, put in much labor. And while most people never reach the wealth that they want, this man thinks he's about to. He's worked and worked and he's like, I got it. And God says to him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? And so Jesus provides this truth here, something that we often miss is that we miss out on the purpose of life because we're so focused on something else. And this man's been building his wealth. He's, he thinks he has it and it's getting bigger and now he's got, it's right in front of him. I got this huge crop. The time is here. I'm about to retire. And God says, truthfully, you're never going to see it. You, you're so focused on money. You think you have the thing that you want, but really all you have is this constant pursuit and this pursuit has caused you never to fully apprehend the thing of which your life should consist. You don't see it. You don't know it. You don't feel it. You've never had it. He's worked hard and he's provided well, but at what cost? We read nothing of a relationship with his wife. We read nothing of um, his relationship with his children. There's not a single word about his impact on society. There's nothing about how he has helped the poor. There's no indication, most importantly, of any sort of relationship with Christ. He's gone through life. He's sailed through life. He's now nearing the end of life. And all he is focused on throughout this entire journey of life is money. I want it and I'm getting it and I'm getting more of it. And yet he's missed out on so much. And that's what Jesus is telling him. You think your life consists of money. You think you have joy. You think you have happiness because you have money. And yet you're not even seeing that you're continually pursuing it and pursuing it and pursuing it. And even now you are rich and I've given you this huge crop and all you're thinking about is how you can store it up and make more. Not even understanding that you're still not going to be happy. Plus, when you die and I'm about to take your life away, you're going to look back and have nothing to look forward to. He's missed out on the joy of marital bliss if he was married. There's no indication um, of the things that he could have had with his wife. He's not had the relationship with his kids that he could have had. He's missed out on the little things like spending time playing with his kids. He's missed out on taking his little boy to the lake and fishing or playing dolls with his little girl. He's missed out on things like taking them to the zoo. And I realize they're probably not a zoo back then, but you get the point. He's missed out on the little things in life because all he has ever been focused on is building his wealth. He's missed out on that very unique bond between a father and a child. The children have missed out on a dad that spent his time with them, that nurtured them, that admonished them, that taught them, that showed them the love of Christ. His employers probably saw a very dedicated, hardworking boss. He provided a way of paying bills. He provided a paycheck. But did he provide anything more? Did he show them what life was all about? Did he mentor them? Did he teach them? Did he show them that there is a God and that he's following godly principles? And then above all that, for this man is the fact that there's no relationship with God. The man thought he had found the meaning of life and money. He thought that's where it's at. He thought he had enough to relax and live out the rest of his days in luxury. He was going to move from Texas to the Bahamas and kick back on a beach for the rest of his life and enjoy it. Jesus says that's not life. 
All you've done is work. There's no joy in that. There, there's no goodness. He, he missed out on having the joy that Jesus Christ can provide. He missed out on the fulfillment that living out God's will in your life can provide. He missed out on relying on the comforter in the hardest times in life. Looking back, seeing how God encouraged him, encouraged him and built him. And so when this man dies, or when he is sitting on his deathbed, he's going to look back, and all he's going to see is wealth. I got a bunch of money. What's he going to be remembered for? And what does it mean? And Jesus says, it means nothing. What does your life consist of? Is there something like that in your life this morning? Is there something that, if God was to say to you right now, you have one hour left, what does your life consist of? We'd be thinking about it. What, what did I do? I'm, I'm about to go meet Jesus Christ face to face. How did I spend my time? What was my focus? Where did I spend my money? Perhaps a better way to think of it is look to the person on your left or right and think, if I was to ask my wife, what would she say my life consists of? Or what would your best friend say your life consists of? What would your child say your life consists of? What, what would the person closest to you say your life consists of? This should grab our attention. Because I, I, I want a good relationship with my children, but if I ask my child, what's most important to daddy, what's he going to say? I'm completely okay if he says Jesus Christ. But if he says money, I should feel that tall. If he says work, I should feel humiliated. If he says something other than my wife, my God, or himself, that's a problem. And Jesus is saying, life's about more. Life's not about wealth, it's about relationships. Relationship primarily with the Father and relationships with those that we are to influence. What's the focus of your life? Do your kids think all that daddy wants is money? Does your best friend say all she cares about is work? Does your wife say all he cares about is going to the lake and fishing? I, I don't know what it may be. My wife says I use fishing as an example too much. Maybe because that's my problem, because I like fishing. Um, but, but is there a focus there? So something that's beyond just a, yeah, I like to do this from time to time. Is there something with which you are obsessed? Life can be about whatever you want it to be about. But Jesus says, your life does not consist of what you have. It's meant to consist of more. He says, I created you. He is the creator God. And he says, the focus in this world is meant to have true lasting meaning. And it can have true lasting meaning if we will follow him. And yet, this man, instead of having a good life, all he had was a focus on a pursuit. And when we focus on things in this world, that's all we have, a pursuit. Like Solomon says, it has wings and it flies away. Every time we get close to it, we feel like we got it, but we never do. And in verse 21, Jesus sums it up and he says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So he gives this parable, first of all. He gives this parable that says, you're going to miss the meaning of life if you're focused on things. You're going to miss the meaning of life. That's all you care about is things. But Jesus then, he goes on, he finishes the parable, which is um, somewhat negative in tone, as I think I have just indicated, and he flips the coin. And now he's going to speak to it from a positive perspective. He speaks to it from a negative perspective in the parable, and then we get to um, verse 22, and he starts looking at it from the positive perspective. So if I'm not supposed to focus on money. If that's not the thing of which my life is to consist, what is life to be about? And so we get to verse 22 and it says, and he said unto his disciples, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. And so Jesus here um, starts off by saying, there's no reason to worry about money. And I love this fact. Is money part of life? Absolutely. Do I have to have money to live? Yes. But Jesus says, why, why do you worry about it? And that's just how he starts off. I take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you're going to put on, right? Isn't the body more than meat and life more than raiment? I, 
is your life just about food and clothing? And Jesus says, yes. Your life's not just about that. Stop focusing on the money. And you get to verse 24, down to verse 28, and I love how he starts comparing. He says, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? He says, I feed the ravens, every one of them in the world. Uh, somebody did a study on this one time. I wish I could remember the numbers. I will just make them up off the top of my head. So these are completely fictitious at this point. But it, it was something like it was going to cost like $500 million a day to feed every bird in the world. I, I, it was some astronomical. I feel like it was actually higher than that. I don't remember what it was, but he's like, God just feeds them. It doesn't cost him a penny. Right? He just does it because he's God. And we start to get that comparison here. He says, I feed the ravens. Which of you taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? He says, look, you think you're in control, but you can't even make yourself grow. I mean, we can make ourselves grow, but we can't make ourselves grow, right? Um, yeah, you guys are with me. Um, anyway, so, so he says that. And then he says, if you be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like unto one of these. He says, look at the lilies, they're beautiful. But they don't even do anything. He said, I just make them grow like that. I love that. And verse 28, if then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? He said, look, the grass grows and we cut it and we throw it into a kiln and we make brick out of it. Has anybody ever tried that? I wonder if that works. Like, is that only like Middle Eastern grass or can we actually cut our grass and make brick out of it? Um, anybody want to try that this week and let me know if it works? I'm curious about that because we always have these grass clippings. What do you do with them? Let's make brick out of them and sell them. And we'll have a side business as a church and we'll sell bricks. Um, Nobody looks willing to do that. All right, anyway, uh, but think about the grass. He says, I make it grow. It doesn't do anything. It's just there. I take care of it. It grows up. It's mine. And he says, if I can take care of the grass, and if I can take care of the lilies, and if I can take care of the birds, and if I can take care of all of the beasts, and if I can feed everything in this world, why are you, Christian, so worried about money? Don't you think I can take care of you? Don't you trust me? Why are you spending all of your time thinking about work and thinking about how you're going to make money and thinking about all of these other things? Don't you trust him? Money is important in life, but if you believe in God, it never needs to be your focus. Yes, there are godly principles, and I am to live right. I am to have a job, right? He that should not work should not eat. Very clear biblical principle. I am to handle my money. I'm to have a budget. And I'm not to spend outside of my means. And there are many verses about we shouldn't really take loans. And if we will follow those and just trust him, he'll take care of it. What was the best part of your life? Think about it, about it right now. Like if you pick a snapshot, there's probably several of them. But one that always comes to mind, best part of life is when you're a child. Why? Because I didn't have to worry about anything. I'd get up and I would play until my mom said I had to go to school. And then I'd very begrudgingly go to school and I would be miserable throughout the day. And then I would get home and then I'd break out my toys and I would play. And I would pretend like I did my homework and just really not care about anything else. Like I just loved life. I loved riding my bike outside. We lived on a um, street like you guys don't have around here too often, right? They, not. Not everything in Indiana is a neighborhood. There's very few, like, big additions. Like, you have additions here the size of cities in Indiana, okay? Like, Siena Plantation is the size of, like, some of our smaller cities. Maybe some of our bigger cities. I don't know. Um, I lived on a street, Wayland Drive. There was, like, 14 houses on it, but it was just a street. It wasn't an addition. There were no covenants. Nobody made us pay an HOA, right? I mean, there was none of that. Nobody could tell us what to do. Like, my dad felt like building us a elevated playground in the backyard. He didn't have to ask anybody's permission. Like, it was a wonderful thing. Like, I moved down here, and like, they tell you how high you have to cut your grass and everything else. It's crazy. What is, anyway, we won't get into the communism of Texas and their HOAs. Um, but I, you know, I, I lived outside. I remember for a while, my parents had a rule in the summer that I was only allowed to be inside my house for an hour a day. Like, you know, at night we obviously could, but during working, like, that was the rule. You can't be inside the house for more than an hour. And then we had our Nintendo, which had Duck Hunt on it. And man, I loved it. I could rock some Duck Hunt. I mean, 
that little dog, he wasn't shaking his head at me. It was awesome. Uh, and I say all that because like, I'm outside riding my bike. We're doing go-karts. I got a moped that I had to jerry-rig to get to run and like, had to start it with a drill. It was like, because like, I, I didn't have money for a starter. And, but whatever, we got it to run. And we, we, you know, we'd do whatever. We'd steal gas from the lawnmower and put it in there and ride it around the neighborhood. And my buddy had a go-kart, and we'd ride that. And I remember flipping that and thinking I broke my neck one time. It's so much fun. I mean, just out there doing our things. And why am I telling you all of this? Because I had no worries. Because mom and dad paid the bills, and they made sure there was food. There was nothing to worry about when I was a kid. And God is saying here, you're my child. Don't, don't you trust me? I'm going to provide you food. All you got to do is serve me. All you got to do is work. All you got to do is take care of your family. All you got to do is this, that, and the other, and I'll provide it. You just do your part. You don't need to make money your focus. It's not a wealth-building regime that God created. He says, just trust me. If you're focused on money, you're going to miss out. You're not going to see what life was meant to consist of. You're going to miss it because you're so focused on other things. We get to verse 29 and 30, and he says, And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. It doesn't really even seem like we need to be so concerned that we're praying about this. Not, I'm not saying not to, but, but he says your God knows you have need of it. He just knows. Look, God knows the ravens need food. He knows you need food. Just trust him. He knows your needs. Again, Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. In law school, shall means will is definitive, cannot be altered or broken, right? It's like the law of the Medes and Persians. If God says shall, it is shall and it will be done. And my God shall supply all your need. Doesn't say all your wants, but it'll supply all your need. If we focus on him, he is going to take care of us. He is going to provide what we need, but we have to learn to trust him. When you trust God to provide for your needs, you can focus on living rather than where the next check's going to come from, right? When we can rely on God as we live out his word, we can go forward watching God work, not worried about, am I going to have enough money when I retire? Yes, we've got to follow the godly principles to set money aside, but we don't have to worry about it because he says if we will just follow his principles in his word, he'll take care of the rest. He'll supply our needs. He'll supply what we need. And so he lays out the principles. We just have to follow them. And if we do, he's going to take care of everything else. And then we get down to verse 31. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. And Jesus is saying, now this is what life consists of. You're missing out to this man who just says, have him give me my inheritance. He says, no, you're missing out on all of life because you're so focused on money. It's ruining you. You're missing who I am. You're not getting any of the joy out of life. And Jesus says, if you will just trust me, I will provide what you need. And then all these things shall be added unto you. All these things, the things of which life should consist. A marriage and how good it can be. The memories are good. The joy, the happiness in the marriage, the love is going to be good in it. The, the relationship with your children, the time you spent with them, the things you look back at. Man, I remember, I was thinking about this message this morning, looking at some of the pictures on the wall in my office and just remembering Samuel and Reagan when they were like this big. And like Sam had an all funky looking head and don't say that to him, but you know, babies come out and they don't look like they do today, right? And so, you know, they were twins, and yeah, he had, you look at the picture in my office, you think I'm making fun of my kid, I'm not. He, he had a funky looking head, didn't he, wife? Yeah, he did. Um, I, I miss holding that little guy. He was so cute and so fun. He had like, he was so ill-built when he was a baby. Like, he got to walk when he was like, I, one, one and a half, whatever it was, and he would run, but his legs were like this long, and the rest of his body was like this tall. I, like, he's grown into his legs now at this point. They're, they're normally proportioned, but I, I just remember that little man running and like, this big a body, and it was like a cartoon. It was like a character. Choo, 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 choo. It, was, it was awesome. I miss that. I miss spending time with him. At that. But, but I look back, and I, I'm so glad I remember it. I'm so glad I spent time with him. 
your focus on your friends and your family and maybe how you get through hard times together. How you've had fights but you forgave them because you were supposed to. And now your relationship is stronger. The love you had, the help, the nurture, the time you've spent with them. You work and your work should be a calling from God. This is what I know God wants me to do with my life. And no matter what that is, it should be used to build his kingdom. You think about days at work where, yeah, that job had a lot of evil people in it. But, you know, I was able to win that person to Christ. Right? I, I shared the gospel with everybody. I can't make them listen, but I, I did what I could. I was a testimony as much as I could be. But more than anything about the communion we have with God. There's nothing like communion with God. The relationship that we can have on a continual basis with our Heavenly Father. I love the song, He Walks With Me and He Talks With Me. That's what God does. He's there with us and it's good. There's nothing that I need to worry about because He's in control. My God walks with me and He talks with me and He takes care of me and He's right there with me. I don't have to worry. And so Jesus says, what's your life consist of? Verse 32 to verse 34, he closes it out. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that felleth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's a call to action. He's talking to his disciples now as we're reading this about halfway through. It says in verse 22, and he said unto his disciples. It's kind of like he understood that this guy may not be paying as much attention as some of the others were. And he's going on anyway. He's saying, look, some of you have this problem. Some of you are so focused on other things that you're missing it. But I want to provide all you need. And so we get to verse 32 and he, he calls to action. He says, don't be afraid. He says, sell what you have. Give alms. Provide your bags. Provide yourself bags which wax not old. He says, it's time to shift. Shift perspective. If you need to sell your stuff and get rid of it so it's not your focus anymore, do it. If you need to do something drastic in your life to make sure that you find what God means for in your life, then it's time to do it. It's not time to keep playing this game thinking, oh, I'll shift away from it, I'll shift away. No, either make the break or do something drastic to get to it. And if you have to sell what you have, sell it because your relationship with God and your influence on your wife and on your children or your husband or your friends or your family, whatever your sphere of influence in this life is, that is paramount. That is the thing that your life consists of, following God and leading others to do the same. And we go back to our theme. It's it's time to contend. We got to fight for our own lives. We got to fight to get our life on the right path. And then we got to fight for others. There's no good way of saying it other than I got to help other people do the same because people are all somewhat alike. We struggle with this. And yet God has more. He says, if you will make me your treasure, right? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Are you going to keep focusing on money? Are you going to switch it to something else? And Jesus says, switch it. Switch your treasure to Jesus, and he will provide what you need. It's interesting to think about the rich young ruler um, that went to Jesus, that wouldn't give up his goods. Jesus said the same thing to him. It's kind of this ongoing saga throughout history, right? We want to focus on goods, but if we do, we're going to miss out on the goodness that God intends for us. So we can have the goods that I find or I can have the goodness of God. That's the choice. Which one does your life consist of? The goods that you've been getting or the goodness of God? The focus on money is a very frequent one, but it's just a pursuit. Again, money is a fill-in for any number of things. How are you spending your time? Again, the illustration is money, but the question is universal. What's your life consist of? What is the treasure of your heart? What's the thing that has your attention? I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. I don't know how the Lord may be working on anyone's heart this morning, but in just a moment, we'll have a verse of invitation. And if God spoke to you, I encourage you to come. Our lives are short. They're very temporal. 70, 80, 90 years. At the end of that, what do you have to look back on? Have you been pursuing God and 
you're going to look back completely con content and fulfilled with the thing that your life consists of? Or are you going to be searching? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day you've given us. I thank you for what you teach us here out of the book of Luke, Lord God. Lord, I just ask that you would use this message according to your will in the lives of the people that are here this morning. If you would have someone to make a change this morning in their life, I ask that they'd make it. If there's one here who is unsaved, Lord, I ask that you would just give them the courage to walk the aisle to this altar this morning and talk to someone about how they can know that they have eternal life, Lord God, how that they can shift their focus from the temporal life to the eternal one that you have to offer. Lord, we ask that you would bless in this invitation. We thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.